Hello and welcome. This is a podcast explaining Ukraine by ukraineworld.org, a website in English about Ukraine. Today we will talk about Germany and its ambiguous stance with regard to Russian invasion of Ukraine. Why is Germany reluctant to engage more with Ukraine to supply arms that Ukrainians are asking for and to acknowledge that its usual policy of finding compromise with Russia has failed? Our guests are famous German politicians, co-founders of the Center for Liberal Modernity in Berlin, Marie-Louise Beck and Ralf Fuchs. We are making this conversation in Kyiv during their second visit to the Ukrainian capital since the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine and on their way to Kharkiv, a city 40 kilometers from the Russian border and 30 kilometers from the front line. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I am chief editor of ukraineworld.org. Ukraine World is brought to you by Internews Ukraine, one of the biggest and largest Ukrainian media NGOs. Before we start, let me remind you that you can support us on patreon.com slash ukraineworld and you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube and various podcasting platforms. So Marie and Ralf, uh, thanks so much for joining this podcast. We are now in Kiev. This is the second time that you visit Kiev during this full-scale invasion of Russia. And we already met you in March in very difficult circumstances, when Kiev was uh, under very difficult circumstances. What was it at that time to, to come to Kiev? What, what, did, what did it mean and what does it mean now? Well, I'm, I have been educated, I must say, by the experience of the war in Bosnia. And uh, I was going in and out um, bringing humanitarian aid, but actually what I learned is the main message was we care. And you are inside, and we, fortunately, are outside. But for the psychology, for keeping up spirit, for going through all those difficult times, it means a lot when people from the outside are coming. And I think that was the main reason. We are not high-ranking politicians, we were not the chancellor, but at least we could go without a big fuss around us, and I think that was the main. <laughs> but at the same time, I would say it was, and of course also for Marie Louise, uh, an instrument to get more information and to get more public interest to press our government to change its policy towards Ukraine. It's important to be here if you want to communicate with the uh, political public in, in, in Germany. And I would say at our first visit, it played out quite well. Of course, as well Open said, some we, doors. Are, we are no high ranking. People, we, are, we have no official political position, but uh, there was a huge um, press echo and also in the parliament and uh, in, in the government there was some, I would say, feedback to our visit. But uh, everybody here, people who are interested in Germany, know you and uh, your organization, uh, Centrum für Liberale Moderne, as uh, I think one of the best uh, friends of Ukraine. Right? You, you are one of the, those people who are the most outspoken in Germany about Ukraine. And this comes for a very long time. It's not coming now. So can you, can you remember what, what was the first impetus for you to establish the Centrum and to, uh, to think about Ukraine primarily? Because you established a, a, a website, Ukraine Verstehen, I had the pleasure also to participate in your wonderful book, Ukraine Verstehen. So why, why did you care about Ukraine even before it was a kind of a fashion? Well, about the center, Ralph has to talk about the general idea, the bigger roof. Uh, I'm talking about Ukraine underneath that uh, roof of liberal modernity. Yeah, but it so started I, before please, we go ahead. Um, um, established, established the Center for Liberal Modernity. Um, at latest, I would say in 2010, when I still was uh, the president of the Heinrich Böll Foundation, the political foundation of the Green Party in, in Germany, and we opened an office here in Zang Kiev, because already then uh, you could anticipate that Ukraine would become of a, a battleground uh, in this big fight between liberal democracy and authoritarianism. 
uh, and, and a really a kind of a crucial uh, state in this uh, fight and, and that uh, Ukraine um, on the one hand is an, an, an object of desire for uh, Putin and the, the ruling elite in, in, in Russia uh, who want to restore the empire and at the same time um, it is an, an, an potential asset for, for, for Europe in terms of security but also in terms of um, uh, democratic development in the post-Soviet space. And Marie then, and me also in 2014, uh, for us the Maidan really was, was an enormous political and personal experience. In 2010, I was still mostly engaged in Belarus, because in 2010, until it was beaten down by Lukashenko at that time, uh, Actually, we had the feeling the biggest chance that there is reforms and moves towards democracy could be Belarus. And it uh, was beaten down by Lukashenko and ended the first time in 2010. So 2014, when we visited Maidan practically constantly, um, for a long time, I was not so optimistic. And actually, I, I was really surprised that in the end, the Maidan managed to make Yanukovych leave the country and flee, that you really made it. So you were thinking that Belarus had a more cap capacity for democratization than Ukraine? Yes. In yes. More capacity? Well, yes, because you, we had the feeling um, there is... A lot of young people from Belarus traveling to the West. Berlin was very much the center for a lot of uh, people from Belarus going back and forth. Uh, there was different parties uh, already at that time. They, are, they had no oligarchs. Those parties were mm. really going along political ideas, social democrats. Statkiewicz, you know, for years and years sticking to the democratic, social democratic idea. There was a little Green Party and, and others. There was a strong Helsinki committee. Uh, for me, mm. I have to admit, in those years, uh, Belarus looked pretty good. And at that time, we did not have the idea yet that Putin might be so imperial that he would really dare to reach out to Belarus. Uh, so yes, at that time, um, maybe because I knew it better than I did Ukraine, but there was quite a bit of movement. That's in interesting Ukraine. because I, I never was so engaged uh, with Belarus than, than you. In my then perception, uh, then Belarus was still much more post-Soviet uh, than, than, than Ukraine. Therefore, they didn't have oligarchs. Which, which had a, yeah, but uh, Ukraine, in my, in my experience, then, I, then we started with some uh, NGOs and civil society partners, maybe around 2006 or after the first uh, then Maidan. Um, there was a very, already then, a very vivid civil society. So, so we saw quite a huge democracy Democratic potential uh, from the grassroots in the, in the society. Let's talk about today. Today, this uh, situation. Uh, frankly speaking, in Ukraine, Germany is perceived very critically uh, uh, because there is a feeling that it Germany is always kind of slowing down and delaying, especially in the question of arms supply. Do you share this estimation? Yes. Unfortunately, there is a pretty clear answer. This is yes. Um, number one is doing all those years until we had elections and this long period of Angela Merkel's uh, reign in, in the Chancellor's office. Uh, I think Ukraine really was, was convinced, and I was too, that Angela Merkel is really for her. It is one of the 
most important questions in her life, in her political, political biography, to really hold her hands over Ukraine. And um, it is true that she was, um, she was really outspoken towards Putin. I think she was maybe the only one amongst those Western politicians at that time who knew the country well enough, who knew Russia well enough, who knew Putin well enough to be outspoken, to confront him. And I think she really was the one who um, was the center of keeping the European countries together with the sanctions politics. And I know that from talks uh, when she said it's so difficult to keep them all on board, and she was working on that. Still, though, um, I would say if you now look back, um, <laughs> uh, actually we have to say this long uh, period of appeasement politics in different stages now turns out to have been a big mistake. Which, and you have, we have the stages, we have Crimea, appeasement number one, Donbass, Minsk, including your president, but he was not really free to decide because he had the encircled soldiers in the Balsavo. Uh, Minsk one, Minsk two, was appeasement in the end for those eight years afterwards, appeasement, and now Putin took the next step. And this is something which history has told us does not help. And we are afraid that uh, with the macron scholz draghi visit ahead, that they might push towards a Minsk III, <laughs> which would be lesson not learned. Mm. I would even say that Germany has a share of responsibility for that war. Yeah, with these constant signals to, to Moscow and to, to, to Putin that we are not willing to confront Russia and that we are always looking for compromise and we, we are not willing to arm Ukraine, to send weapons to Ukraine to deter a potential an attack from and we from make our business Russia yeah and um, <laughs> and at the same time with our special energy relations with uh, Russia of course Germany funded the, the 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 Russian war machine to to a quite significant extent so from this angle we would have even more reasons now Uh, for really firm and, and de uh, decisive uh, support of, of Ukraine. One of the biggest slogans of the post-World War II is never again. And it's interesting, when I traveled in the villages, which was covered by the, by the shellings, by the big, big shellings actually near Kiev, there was one monument on which it was written never again, Nikola's novel, mm. but on the road there was Russian tank and there was everything was destroyed. So you, you can see this surreal image, right? Yeah, yeah. For, 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 for you, for Ukraine, I think there is an immediate collective uh, memory uh, on the, the Second World War, which is reactivated now by the, the Russian aggression. In Germany, it's quite, I would say, ambiguous. Yeah, what what is the meaning of this um, famous "never again"? Yeah, is it only about never again war against Russia, or is it about our responsibility to prevent another genocidal war and to to to, to fight against the war of aggression? And the responsibility to protect people. So, and and then you you have a tendency that that um, we only um, reduce this historical responsibility um, to to Russia and not to uh, the other. Uh, former uh, Soviet uh, nations, which are now fighting for their independence from Russia. Well, I think there is even 
another facet, another aspect to it. This never again, and I remember 1980 being already a young teacher. Um, I went out on the street against Pershing II, of course with a slogan never again, and I was convinced that this was the only conclusion our generation could draw from the historical responsibility of Nazi Germany, which was never again, if we would have been more precise, we would have said never again aggression from the German soil, which is correct. The, what was obviously missing was the perspective of the Polish people, the French people, the British people who, uh, if they had not fought against Germany with military, would have been, Europe would have been taken over by Nazi Germany. And um, somehow it almost is a delegitimation. De de oh, 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 very difficult. <laughs> Delegitimized? <laughs> yes, it delegitimizes um, the military fight against Nazi Germany, which I think is pretty touchy, and we should, should really discuss about that. We started it with the Bosnian War, it was forgotten, and we have to go back to this uh, to this part of our history. I think the, the, there's a legitimate, I think, ethical uh, position to be pacifist. Yeah, but this is an individual uh, statement. This is an individual decision. Yeah, I don't want to exercise violence against other human beings, even against animals. So, but this is not the political uh, debate. The, the term political pacifism was always a little bit shady. Uh, uh, it, was, it had this element, not with us, so we want to keep away uh, from risky than conflicts. And it was this denial of this historical than experience that Nazi Germany has to be fought and, down by violence. And, and I mean, you really have to bring it down to, to the real consequences. In Bosnia, every village and every city which was not defended and the military outfit was even worse <laughs> than here, but I think the, the uh, opposite uh, side was not as strong as Russia is now, but again, village by village, if the men, and it was mainly the men, did not stay and did not defend the village, the Serbs, the Chetniks came in, they drove the people out, they raped the women. So those men who individually decided, I don't want to fight, went to Germany, for example, which they could other than here. I always had a very... Mm distant feeling towards them. And if them. the Ukrainians would not fight, the whole country would become a big butcher. Yeah. So this is the consequence. So um, I was always asked, and this actually I think was then the first time that we were confronted this so-called peace generation with a different reality, really with Yugoslavia and Bosnia. Um, then I always had the feeling, okay, uh, if you don't go to defend the people, you really take upon yourself a responsibility. And I was always asked, if you had a son, would you send him uh, to Bosnia? Mm -hmm. I think in peop countries which have real experiences with aggression, it's no question, go to Israel. It's no question that if you are in Israel, even if you are male or female, you join the uh, army because it is existential for the whole country. And this awareness is totally lost in Germany, totally. Do you think that this never again is a slogan which is applied to the era of Nazism? 
and basically it also kind of uh, shadows the problem that Nazism was, of course, a big evil, but it, it's not the only evil, mm. even at that time. That Stalinism was not a lesser evil. In in many cases, Russia, contemporary Russia, is just a continuation of the... Yeah, of in Stalinism. Germany, this is a very difficult uh, discussion because all the time those um, who try to draw some lectures from our evil thang history, they, we insisted on the uniqueness of uh, Nazi Germany, especially because of the Holocaust. Yeah, and, uh, Don't you ever talk about Hitler and Stalin in the same yeah, sentence? Yeah, so we had this fierce debate on Hannah Arendt's book on totalitarianism and the whole concept of totalitarianism in the 50s and, 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 and 60s. Yeah? Um, so which, which, which are already put into the question um, that uh, Nazi Germany was the only evil. Uh, Then in in uh, 30s and, and the 40s in, in in Europe, and now you have the the debate: uh, Can you really compare the contemporary Russia uh, with historical fascism? Yeah, and um, I would say yes. You have a lot of uh, phenomena which which. Uh, would justify to dis describe the, the current Russian regime, I would say going fascist, yeah? going, going full fascist, both in terms of uh, this kind of uh, total control of society and uh, then this uh, extended then repression, but also ideologically. Um, and this is about characteris uh, ca uh, characterizing Uh, current Russia, which kind of regime we have to deal with? Yeah? Is this a regime you can compromise with, or is this a regime which at least have to be contained and deterred if you cannot overrun it military because it's a nuclear power? Of course, this is the big difference to, to Hitler Germany. Yeah? Uh, today's Russia cannot be defeated militarily, But it has at least to be then contained and, and deterred. I want to go one step back uh, in this question, into this question, Hitler and Stalin and those totalitarian systems. I think it's, for me, it's not so important whether you can really now call this a fascist system or not. For me, it would be good enough if there was awareness what Hitler, Sta Hitler Nazism, and Stalinism meant for the people. And for example, that there is almost no knowledge at all uh, that there was a Holodomor in this country, which was created systematically by Stalin, which was created to break the Ukrainian identity uh, and to really make this people and this country disappear. Um, this you have to know, and if you don't know it, then uh, you don't feel obliged to stand at Ukraine's side now. And I'm really almost getting a little nervous uh, when I hear about the peace concerts in Germany and the slogan, stand with Ukraine. If it is not more precise what it means. Uh, it really means this country needs A, that we don't pay Putin's war anymore, B, that we deliver all the military and financial needs this country demands for to, to lose as few people, soldiers, civilians, cities, as possible. Um, and number three, then open the doors uh, into uh, the European Union. All those three questions are on the table. And there is no decisive common voice coming from the German government. Let's government. talk about these three questions, because it is precisely something I wanted to ask you. The first question is energy. 
So Germany is very dependent on Russian gas. There was this decision by European Commission to cut the EU consumption of Russian gas by two thirds by the end of the year. Do you believe that this will happen? And do you believe that Germany will do enough to do that? I think the German government, especially the Green Minister, who is responsible for economy, energy and climate, he is really serious about uh, reducing um, Germany's dependency from Russia gas and oil, both. He is doing quite uh, surprisingly things for a Green Minister going to Qatar and to Egypt and, and other uh, I would say dubious regimes uh, to, to negotiate about uh, like new contracts uh, for gas supply for, for Germany and at the same time they are pushing for um, stepping up with uh, alternative energies and to, to replace gas and, and oil by renewables. So I think yes, they, they are serious, but um, if the um, crucial argument is we can only put sanctions on Russia, which will not essentially hurt the German economy and uh, German pri private house households, you cannot really use energy as a kind of economic weapon against Russia. Yeah, you, you will give Russia long period of, of time to find alternative markets and uh, to uh, circle around the, the, the sanctions. So I think the sanction policy will not really make a decisive difference in the short and maybe even in the medium term. In the long term, yes, it will weaken the Russia, uh, Russian economy. Um, and it will lead to a disinvestment of the Western companies uh, than in, in Russia. Uh, but this is not quick and not substantial enough uh, to force Putin to end this war. Well, you know what? If the argument is we should not put ourselves into a big recession, ourselves into a big economic recession, I think you have to take that serious. Then I would say, okay, <laughs> let's keep our economy going in the West. But, of course, then the profit is going to equip you. I mean, this would be a, uh, a moderate uh, balance, which would work. But what, what we do now is keep our economy going, which is on the number one uh, level, and not equip you. Then we are really financing Putin's, Putin's Creek uh, war. I think we also have to admit that we are living in democracies, and democracies finally and eventually have to ask their people, how far are you willing to go? And what we have now is dramatically rising prices in, in energy, food, and so on. Family really start feeling the war. So again, I would say, yes, uh, we have, if this government would be decisive in saying, we will really try to make living <clears throat> as well, so that you can handle it, you know. But that means on the supportive side, on what is the military side, we are really strong and decided. So let me ask about the weapons, because uh, not only we see certain delays, let's say, let's put it mildly, in supply of German weapons, but we see that private companies are ready to supply, the, the government is blocking it, and other countries are ready to supply, but the, the German government somehow yeah, blocks it. Now with you, well. What's happening? What's happening here? Is it is it is it uh, that uh, psychological barrier that you talked about earlier? Yeah, maybe this is part of uh, the story, but I think the main reason is a political one. This is the narrative: we should not push Putin at the corner. We should not push him 
sozusagen in, in the edge by defeating the Russian young troops in Ukraine. So I would say the, the German government tries to create kind of equilibrium Uh, between Ukraine and 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 then Russia, which uh, in a war, in in my view, is an illusionary then position. The war is about either or, and then shying away from uh, equipping Ukraine with all the weapon weaponry you, you would need to go into a counteroffensive against the, the Russian troops will. Uh, give uh, Putin uh, the upper hand in the war. This will be the final result that Germany will not um, prescribe, Germany will not dictate what Ukrainians finally then have to agree to, to, to come to then an end of the war, but de facto We are weakening the position of the Ukraine vis-à-vis uh, -vis Russia, and this, if not others like the U.S. and uh, the Central Eastern European, the Poles and the Baltics and the Scandinavians will step in, um, will force Ukraine to agree to a, a, a peace agreement under Russian conditions. Do you think that this this position will stand, or is it is it possible to change it in Germany? Because we've heard about this tight and bend uh, and everything, but uh, do you think the government is is changing their minds, or it it is a firm position that will never change? You never know what will happen, but um, at the moment, I would say time is, of course, not playing for Ukraine's interest, because uh, you can see all the German media and they are really, really very devoted, most of them. Uh, although they are really keeping uh, the public debate on the agenda and telling stories and going into the countries and, and in Ukraine. But of course, every day, Topics are coming back, like COVID, probably earlier than we thought. So um, I'm afraid that a really strong change and a push in the sense of we are understanding Putin is not mm -hmm. fussing around and we have to take him serious that the ground is not so good. I would wish that the opposition would take a stronger role and really, I hate to say it, hunt. <laughs> hunt the government and uh, do more to bring in the agenda all those, um, yes, all those double Uh, messages, uh, double bind messages, which are uh, being given the reluctant uh, policy, which is being made the chaos between the different ministries, the Ministry of Defense and the Chancellor's Office, and you don't know, do they really tell you the truth, Don't have they lost oversight, which with our Ministry for Defense you always would believe, because it's a mess since many, many years. So I would wish that, number one, the opposition would play a strong role. I have to admit, since we have a coalition of three, that the liberals would step in more. They are really staying away. Uh, there is one woman who's really fighting a lot, this is the Speaker of the Defense Committee, but the main head of the party, Minister for, for Finance, who is something like a vice uh, chancellor, like Robert Habeck, he, he is not really uh, pushing. Um, and I think the parliamentarians should be more active. This is really something which, um, which annoys me. We have more than 700 parliamentarians. Where are they? Where are they? Uh, and this, for me, is really something I I think that in the end, and maybe it will maybe it will be 
after the war has ended, I'm quite convinced the outcome will be there have been crimes against humanity and there have been, like in Mariupol, maybe Butcher has been genocide. This will be the historical responsibility each and every German parliamentarian, others in this world also, in the West, and our government will have to stand for. They will have to explain would there have been more possibilities to uh, prevent that. And obviously they this question is not really taking them away their night's sleep and <laughs> this is a problem. Not very optimistic, but we are going to the end of our conversation and th there is a third question and I will ask you for a brief answer. The EU candidacy, what is German's government's position on it? Is it defined already, EU candid candidacy for Ukraine? Or we still in this situation, fluid situation when when uh, nothing is decided? It's still um, in the making, the decision of the German government. You had some, I would say, clear signals from Green members of government that they are in favor of it. Also the Minister of Foreign Affairs, also from the Parliament. Um, but Scholz, um, as usual, um, is hiding his uh, position until the final uh, moment. Um, the argument he made is uh, that um, EU candidacy for Ukraine should not come at the expense of the Western Balkan countries, which for long now are in the waiting line. Uh, but of course, this is no real like, political contradiction. This is no either either or. Um, it seems that France is moving to a more positive uh, than position. What would be important for Germany because it's uh, the, the the background of, course, of this uh, argument uh, usually. Uh, used by, by France is we should not weaken the EU by enlarging it uh, to, to an extent we cannot then handle it as a political subject. Yes? So if France it would be willing to, to support the, the candidacy, I think the chances will um, increase that Germany also will step up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph Fuchs and Marie-Louise Beck. Thank you so much again for coming to Kiev. This is a great, great gesture of, of support. Uh, not very typical for German politicians, but you're the exception. This was an Explaining Ukraine podcast by ukraineworld.org. My name is Vodemir Yermolenko. Follow us. This was a podcast Explaining Ukraine by ukraineworld.org. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm a Ukrainian philosopher and journalist, chief editor at ukraineworld.org. Let me remind you that you can support us on patreon.com slash ukraineworld. Ukraine World is brought to you by Internews Ukraine, one of the oldest and biggest Ukrainian media NGOs. Subscribe to Ukraine World on social networks, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. Follow our podcast on SoundCloud, Google Podcast, Apple Podcast and YouTube. Stay with us and stand with Ukraine.